to grab it here. So you got an Amiga of you. Yeah, and um, you have, for example, an extra Amiga disk drive and you around. Or somebody has said that a GoTech drive is very useful, this USB um, floppy disk drive emulator. And um, but you don't know how to connect it, so I thought we'd just briefly have a look at the options, the option that's available. So, let's have a look at the solution. There is actually an adapter, and um, if you look at it, it's formed a little bit weirdly, but this here plugs into the um, external floppy disk connector on the Amiga, and the reason why it's done this way is that the actual connectors, they're very hard to get, um, so I think that's why they decided to, well, they use a, cheap, a standard cheaper connector and then they just modified it. And then, now some packages only contain this, and I don't recommend getting that, I actually recommend getting the, the package that has the power cable, and also, um, has a um, flat cable. So the way this works is relatively simple. So you take this here, connect in the power cable, and what this does is this extracts the 12 volt and the plus 5 on the ground from the actual um, disk drive connector, just like an, a normal Amiga external drive would work except that they're getting very relatively um, hard to find nowadays, the original um, Amiga external floppy disk drives. And they happen to be very expensive, so it's actually cheaper um, getting a hold of these um, um, Amiga uh, floppy disk drives, or, or you can get a PC floppy disk drive with a, also, there are some where you can, I, th I think I found uh, an, ad an adapter uh, card that you plug into the connector to, to be able to plug it into an Amiga. Uh, yeah. And this here needs to be jumpered for DFO0. Right. this end into the Amiga, and we have a working second disk drive. And I mean the GoTech cube connected in the same way, so just the floppy cable and then the power connector, so it's exactly the same as connecting in this. <coughs> so, now right, we're in the um, test corner, i got um, my Amiga 500 Classic here. And I've connected the uh, adapter to the um, floppy port, or the disk port, and it's connected to the disk drive. And um, I took a, a, the disk drive where I have the um, feet connected to it, so then it stands off the table. So I noticed the one I was showing it didn't have the um, st standoff, so. Will be, uh, the mower will take on the table, so I took the, took another one. Anyway, we're just going to put a disc in it. No, I 
I think it was the <laughs> this is the power supply cable. I think I'm too close to the drop. Oh, let's get it over there. I think it might have disturbed the signals. Now, of course, this is not um, fully protected because the um, it's just sitting on the table here. It's the it should actually have this. Um, <clears throat> this one here should be connected to the um, earth of the chassis. When it's out here, then I'm probably not completely protected. Anyway, here we see we have test kit. Um, that's Susan for on it also. I took it out and then it didn't recognize that it was already plugged in. So, so then it's sort of asking me to put it back in again. So. Anyway, that's the info loads. So now I'm on. Why so dark? Well, um, the interesting fact is that this is um, 30 years old and my. Um, Filming lights actually uh, disturb the um, the discs, uh, and especially when this is now like an open cable set up here. And um, the other things I found out that disturb the functionality of the discs is um, Wi-Fi. So if I have the Wi-Fi remote monitoring um, to my um, camera, then um, also weird read failures and stuff start cropping up. So the, the most stable way to run this configuration is to make sure all of my yeah, smart watches and, and mobile phones are not here and I don't use the um, <laughs> my filming light so then it's the most stable. But anyway, we have the... Uh, I, I already booted it into Workbench and now we have the external drive connected. And um, yeah, and I'm just going to see if it works. Actually, load a disk. So, we get test kit. Also get some weird Amiga related things where it's like checking what disk you have in the external drive and then sometimes it like kind of misses that you have the right disk and then it pops up with a message set, like this here. Disk is unreadable. Well it's weird behavior. I'm wondering if the mouse cable is causing some disturbance to the disk also. We've got the mouse cable going right through, passing right past the cable. So as long as one keeps the electromagnetic uh, interference to the lowest possible level, then um, this setup seems to work. But um, if you had an original Amiga external um, drive, and I don't have one, uh, but uh, very, <laughs> very, very, very many years ago I actually had that. That has a. Uh, uh, like a shielded cable, a very thick shielded cable, uh, which goes from the um, t from the back to the disk drive, um, and that provides. I uh, would assume that that provides a lot better um, data transfer shielding than this open um, mechanism. But anyway, as we see, it, it works. So there's nothing really that much more to 
demo, but I was actually f uh, caught by surprise because I had my smart watch on and I was like, no, oh, things are not working correctly. So what I think is happening is that this here, these cables are working like an antenna. And then when one has the Wi-Fi or the lights on, then the the signal gets into this cable and then it also goes into the in, into the computer and then I think it kind of messes up the reading um, synchronization with the external drives. So not, um, not the most stable, but um, yeah, it's a it's a solution as long as one just watches out for um, one doesn't try to just disturb it out too much. Anyway, I'll see you in the next one. Uh, there's one more test I was going to make. Yeah, now I was going to see if my filming lights has an impact. Oh, now the filming lights are on. Oh, well, it forced the. That's interesting because then it's forced the monitor to change channel. So there's some signal coming. Probably a, a ray RF because this has a TV input, so it's probably. Uh, the, t the TVs recognize that there's ah, there's potentially a TV signal, so then it's what to what TV inputs. Okay, and then we're going to uh, just going to take that and then we take it out, make it disappear, and then I'm going to plug it in again. And let's see if it's over there if it gets disturbed by the lights. Because of course now there's no crossing cables that can induce from the lights. So when I pushed it over there then it's not crossing this um, mouse cable. And the mouse cable is like an antenna also. Ah, 35, 30, 35 years ago. So the uh, EMC protection standard there <laughs> wasn't, wasn't any Wi-Fi, there was no Wi-Fi, mobile, no GPRS, no 4G, no 3G, uh, oh. you had 2G, I think, oh, you had 2G just about coming in. Oh, but it seems to be relatively stable as long as it's it could have been, maybe it's the, the mouse cable that's... No, but I, I must conclude after this um, testing that um, this having this open ribbon, ribbon cable is not a, a not a very good um, solution. But it'll do for um, testing external drives and for the use that I need for it too. But just as a warning, so if you would go for this setup, that if you wonder why it's like even the internal drive starts messing up when you have this configuration that it's the it seems to be the EMC um, disturbance so so do what I've done you know move, move all the Wi-Fi uh, or signal creation stuff away and make sure the cables don't cross this um, this flat cable and then it looks like it'll be okay yeah we'll move on